This podcast is brought to you by United Way of Cass Clay. United Way of Cass Clay strives to create a vibrant, welcoming community where everyone can thrive. Get involved at unitedwaycassclay.org. A Wapiton, North Dakota woman kidnapped by a gangster and shot in his getaway car finally gets justice. The mystery of who robbed a Wapiton bank in September 1932 endured until the man bragged about it 40 years later. He was public enemy number one and the scourge of the Midwest. You're listening to The Vault, a form communications podcast featuring true crime and general intrigue from the upper Midwest. I'm Tracy Briggs. Ruth Whips was used to standing out in the crowd. In the fall of 1932, the 46-year-old bookkeeper was the only woman working at Citizens National Bank in Wapata, North Dakota. But even she wasn't quite ready to stand out the way she did on September 30th, when she was grabbed by a bank robber, forced to cling for dear life to the outside of his speeding getaway car, and riddled with bullets. For decades, she never knew the identity of the man, but in 1971, when she was 85 years old and living in a nursing home, she found out that the man who took her hostage was one of America's most notorious gangsters, public enemy number one. It seems Ruth would have quite the story to tell the other residents of the nursing home. And that's just what she did in a special column she wrote for the now defunct The Farmer Globe newspaper of Richland County. The readers were in luck. Her mind was sharp. She was still able to relive that day like it was yesterday. The following paragraphs include some of her memories of the day. Later, the elusive gangster himself tells his side of the story. A beautiful day to rob a bank. Whips begins her story with, It was the last day of September 1932, and a beautiful fall day in North Dakota. I went to work as usual at 8 a.m. All went well until about 10 a.m. At that point, she said a strange man came into the lobby and just stood there. After a while, when she noticed the lobby was empty except for one female customer, he was joined by three or four other men with revolvers. We were told to get down on the floor, which we immediately did including the lady customer, Whips said. According to Whips, the bank's cashier, S.H. Murray, did not drop to the floor. Instead, he ran to his locker to get a gun. On the way, he sounded an alarm. That was as far as he got. One of the robbers gave him a neat rap on the head with his revolver, which put him on the floor in double-quick time. The robbers went on to take whatever money they could, but they weren't done yet. They grabbed Whips and the lady customer, whose name later we would find out was Doris Stock. They used the two women as human bullet shields as they attempted their getaway. The men jumped inside their car, a Hudson, but made the women cling to the running boards as they sped away. The women screamed, at first in terror, and later in pain when gunshots fired by police and others struck them. This is how the Fargo Forum led with the story the next day. Waging a desperate battle for liberty after robbing the Citizens National Bank of $6,707, five bandits left behind them two bleeding and helpless Wapiton women. The bandits eventually dropped whips and stock at an abandoned farm where they were rescued hours later, suffering blood loss from the gunshot wounds to their legs and hips. Ruth recalled later in 1971, I still carry many of the pellets in my hip. Very few of them came out, but they don't bother me. But what did bother whips was that no one was ever arrested. No one was sure who robbed the bank and put two innocent women in the middle of a gunfight. However, the answer came in 1971, when a man named Alvin Carpus fessed up to the crime. The Confession of Creepy Carpus Carpus, nicknamed Creepy for his sinister smile, was the leader of the Carpus Barker gang, which committed robberies, kidnappings, and murders all over the U.S. in the 20s and 30s. In 1934, he had been named Public Enemy Number 1 for his continued criminal activity. 
He was also called the Scourge of the Midwest. He was captured in New Orleans a short time later by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover himself. Carpus was convicted in 1936, not for the bank robbery in Wapaton, but for his role in the kidnapping of wealthy St. Paul brewer William Ham Jr. He served 33 years in prison, 26 of them at the infamous Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. Carpus's involvement in the Wapaton robbery was not even common knowledge during his time in prison. But shortly after being released in 1969 and exiled to his native Canada, which, by the way, that was a condition of him getting out of prison, that he would leave the U.S. and go back home to Canada, he began to talk at that point. He had become something of a minor celebrity, an oddity of sorts, as the three public enemy number ones before him, John Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Babyface Nelson, had all been shot dead. But Carpus was captured, served his time, and now walked free. Film of him from that time shows him blending into the crowds in the streets of Montreal, looking less gangster and more middle school math teacher. Perhaps hoping to make a buck or two, or just to satisfy his ego, he put pen to paper and wrote the Alvin Carpus story, detailing how he became a criminal at just 14 years of age, when he met Ma Barker and her sons. But what caught the attention of the people in North Dakota was his confession to pulling off that bank robbery in Wapiton on September 30th, 1932. At last, an answer for Ruth Whips and the others caught in that tragic day. Carpus's recollection of what he called a strictly routine job in Wapiton closely matched Whips' memories. He wrote of grabbing Whips and Dora Stock after the robbery and making them stand on the running boards of the getaway car, just like Whips had talked about. The cops held fire when they saw the girls on the running boards, but as soon as we cleared the alley, girls or no girls, they opened up at our rear tires. They were shooting buckshot, and the stuff rained on the back of the car like hailstones, Carpus said. He said the women were screaming hysterically as they bounced along the road at 50 miles per hour. Carpus said after one of the women was shot by a sniper, he gave her a shot of morphine. He was probably talking about Ruth Whips, who remembered the incident a little differently. She said, he offered me a shot in the arm, a drink and a cigarette, all of which I politely refused. Upon dumping the women at an abandoned farmhouse, Carpus said, I told the other girl not to blame us, that they could blame the trigger happy guy who fired at the car. After dropping off the women, Carpus knew they wouldn't get much further in their damaged Hudson. The car was rattling like it was going to fly into a million pieces when we pulled into a farmyard beside an ancient dilapidated house. An old Essex sat in the yard, Carpus wrote. They asked the farmer if it would run. He said it would. Then the farmer looked at the gang's getaway car in shambles and said, "'What's this here all about?' They told him that they had just robbed the Wapiton Bank, and they'd give him a few dollars if they could take his car. According to Carpus, the farmer, obviously weary from the Depression, seemed happy to help. You robbed the bank, did you? The farmer said. Well, I don't care. All the banks ever do is foreclose on us farmers. Again, this is Carpus's story, so it's hard to know if the farmer was really happy to help, as Carpus claimed, or frightened that the gangsters weren't really giving him a choice. So what did the people in the middle of the robbery think when they learned in 1971 that Creepy Carpus was responsible for the crime? Murray, the cashier still living in Wapiton, said he was astonished that it was Carpus. We always thought it was Pretty Boy Floyd, Murray said. We heard he had confessed to a lot of bank holdups, including ours. Murray also mentioned that a week after the robbery, he received a postcard written in blood threatening him for pulling that alarm. It had been mailed from Wilmer, Minnesota. By 1971, Doris Stock had married a man named W.E. Rule, and she was living in Louisville, Kentucky. She, too, was surprised that it was Carpus. I didn't think we were being so honored at the time. We thought it was someone much less notorious. Ruth Whips, for a time, also thought it was Pretty Boy Floyd, but when a reporter from the Farmer Globe showed her pictures of Carpus that day in her nursing home, she knew he was the guy. That's the way he was dressed, too. He wore a suit with a white shirt and tie and a straw hat. Only he had a gun in each hand, she recalled. 
News reports of Carpus around the time of his book release show a man who seemed to have very little remorse for what he had done in Wapiton all those years ago. He bragged that he had, quote, made Hoover's reputation, end quote, since the FBI chief had captured him. He said Ma Barker, nicknamed Bloody Mama, was just a plain old hillbilly woman, and his friend Al Capone was a really nice guy. To some, he came off like a smug creep with little interest in anyone but himself. Book critic Jack McFall of the Chicago Sun-Times wrote, In professional and private life, he was no friend to man, or more to the point, to women. Snug in hideouts, the thief did nothing to help his wife or later his pregnant girlfriend when they were arrested. Carpus was actually in a brothel when he heard his pregnant girlfriend had given birth to their son. Interestingly, the madam there would be the one to tip off the FBI about his whereabouts. It couldn't have happened to a more deserving fellow, wrote McFall. Carpus moved to Spain in 1973 and died from natural causes in 1979. Ruth Whips, the soft-spoken bookkeeper, lived until she was 90. She took to her grave the terror of that wild ride on the running boards as buckshot whistled around her head and bullets struck her flesh. But she survived in spite of creepy Carpus. She had finally learned his identity. Turns out, she implied, it wasn't really one worth knowing. She said, they weren't very nice men. You've been listening to The Vault, a forum communications podcast covering true crime and general intrigue from the upper Midwest. Stay connected to your community and save. Just 99 cents a month gets you three months of unlimited access to inform.com. Visit inform.com slash subscribe and get your first three months of news for only 99 cents a month.